This conference will now be recorded. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you all are doing well and staying safe out there. This is Walt Prentice with Applied Flow Technology, and today we are talking about becoming a steam piping system expert with AFT Aero. I am a business applications engineer over with AFT, so what I do is I combine the business side of things, sales stuff, uh, with the technical side of the software, so application of the software in your real systems. And if you've never heard of AFT before, what we do is we simulate your fluid flow through your pipes. Uh, long story short, we take what's going on in your system, we model it on your computer, so you can figure out flow distributions, pressure distributions, things like that. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So, today we are going to talk about compressible flow theory basics. Um, I don't want to just show you, you know, exactly what steps to take in the software. I want to make sure you have a good fundamental understanding of the nature of compressible flow because it's a bit tricky. Then we're going to go into how Aero accounts for this and how we model it. And then what's so special about STEAM? being a unique fluid, there's some extra considerations. Then we'll go through specifically modeling with AFT Aero, an example model, so you can see the software in action and the role of heat transfer as well, because uh, that plays a pretty big part in compressible flow. And then finally, we're going to go through a case study of how Qt Engineering used Aero to modify an auxiliary steam system for a power plant, uh, pretty much moving from the theory we will discuss at the beginning to real life concerns and a real life solution. But before we get too far, let's talk about safety. So especially in today's world, it's, a, you know, it's really easy to be hunched over like this guy over your computer sitting all day. Well, we recommend not doing that because it is bad. So be aware of your sitting. Uh, desk engineers, especially field engineers, maybe not so much, but you know, us at desk, we gotta worry about it. And uh, as silly as it sounds, it's known as sitting disease, quite intuitive, but it's a real issue. Metabolic issues arise from sedentary lifestyle. And there is a company called Just Sand that compiles all the research for you. If you're interested, you can visit their website there. Bottom line, you're human. So moving around is what you're made to do. Get up throughout the day, clear your mind, clear your body, make your day more productive, and keep you healthy. All right. So let's get into compressible flow. What is it? Well, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's flow that compresses. And specifically, density is a function of temperature and pressure. You need an equation of state to figure out what your density is. Incompressible flow assumes density is, does not change with pressure. Uh, so this is our sister program, AFT Fathom, that will model incompressible flow, usually liquids, uh, and also low velocity gases and low pressure gases, uh, things like HVAC applications. But specifically, density will not be changing, at least with pressure. Uh, we can get it to change with temperature, but that's just from tabular data, not, not an equation of state. And the density changes are pretty minor. So we need to use a more sophisticated program like Aero when we're operating at higher velocities and pressures. Um, and this is really up to the engineer to decide, is it okay to go with incompressible assumptions or should we move to a more specialized compressible flow simulation? And a good rule of thumb is to stay away from incompressible assumptions because they will bite you in the butt. Uh, and it's you know better safe than sorry. Like I said, compressible flow has a lot more uh, complex nature to it and you wanna take that into account when you're modeling. So some specific considerations that make it differ from incompressible flow. So let's see here, you've probably seen this and know it as the continuity equation. Essentially what's happening is that at steady state, this mass flow is staying constant, right? And usually in incompressible flow, density is constant, and if we're in the same pipe, the cross-sectional area is constant, thus velocity is constant. Well, in compressible flow at steady state, density can be changing, it can be going up or down, velocity will then have to change if we're in the same cross-sectional area, and that's unintuitive. Within the same pipe, you can have velocity changing throughout the length, and often it actually, it does a lot because we have pressure drop, density changes, then velocity changes. It's not so intuitive. Here we go. 
Now let's take into account heat transfer. That's gonna have a large impact as well, especially with that density there. Again, we'll get into that with the equation of state a little later on. We have sonic choking that we have to pay attention to in compressible flow systems. We do not usually pay attention to that in liquid systems or in compressible flow because the velocities are so much higher in compressible flow that we actually approach the local sonic velocity. And the governing equations are strongly coupled, and there's more of them, and it's a giant matrix, essentially. So it adds complications, especially when we're dealing with pipe networks. It gets complicated within one pipe, but you can imagine when we have a huge network with compressors and different outflows and inflows, it gets quite complex. And simplified incompressible flow equations do not take this into account. Okay, so let's look at those governing equations I mentioned to figure out exactly what we need to solve for. Okay, first we have the conservation of mass, which is what you saw on that previous slide in a different form. So here we have density changing and velocity changing, uh, and we're dividing by density and velocity respectively to keep this non-dimensional so we can have them in the same equation. But you can see here, at steady state, so no accumulation, if density goes up, well, velocity goes down, right? So we're gonna see that play out when we're looking at these example models, okay? Conservation of momentum. This is a very popular topic in the study of fluid mechanics. Uh, pressure is a momentum flux. And you've seen this equation before, I'm sure, Bernoulli's equation. And here we're taking into account pipe frictional losses through the system. Um, and this is it in its differential form. You probably have seen it with deltas in place of the derivatives here. Um, but this is the true fundamental form. Okay. Well, we also have the conservation of energy. All of these are coming from first principles that we base our whole world off of. So with the energy here, we have enthalpy, which is accounted for in temperature, uh, internal energy, and then the flow energy, and kinetic energy, specifically the energy of the fluid moving, and potential energy. Here we have the heat uh, in and out of the system, so we can make a lot of simplifying assumptions if you know it's an adiabatic system or potential energy change is negligible, and we'll get into that. Well, we also have to account for an equation of state with compressible flow. As we talked about a little earlier, density here is a function of pressure and temperature. The Z here is the um, uh, compressible uh, compressibility factor here, uh, but essentially what this is is the ideal gas equation of state just to show you uh, simplification but not everything will follow the ideal equation of state the point is you need an equation of state so that complicates things right if we're changing density with temperature and pressure oh well changing density changes velocity velocity is going to change pressure drop velocity is going to change energy throughout the system you can see how very coupled it is but that's not all actually we have one more thing to take into account and that is the enthalpy and that's a function of pressure and temperature, and that will fit right here into this energy equation. So we've got five equations here that we need to couple together and solve for. And these are the fundamental equations for all fluids, right? Like I said, this is, these are from first principles. So what's the difference in solving these for gases? Well, the difference is we actually have to solve these differential equations. Uh, we do it numerically, obviously being software rather than analytically. But what you probably have seen with incompressible flow, as I said, is you see these as deltas, not differentials. So we're looking at, say we have a pipe here. In liquid flow, you're really looking at the inlet condition and the outlet condition. And we just kind of fill in the blank, assuming a linear pressure drop, things like that, right? So we can just look at the inlet and outlet. Well. That only works because we're assuming velocity is going to be constant and density is going to be constant because they don't change with pressure. So we can make these simplifying assumptions. That makes you know, the conservation of energy a lot easier, momentum easier. Conservation of mass becomes quite simple because we don't have those things changing. And we don't need an equation of state to describe our density. In compressible flow, we have to take this uh, delta here, this derivative, go all pretty much take it to zero, you know, going back to calculus class, we're taking this delta to an infinitely small point and solving it that way so we can find an actual profile through the pipe with so many things changing. Now what arrow does is we do that uh, numerically and we use a set distance across the pipe 
to solve this instead of just inlet and outlet, but we will go through that a little bit later. No need to get too far into it right now. Okay. Now let's talk about static and stagnation properties. This comes up a lot in our software and in general fluid studies. So let's give a quick recap. Static property is the normal thermophysical property you'd measure. So if you are looking at your pipe and you've got a pressure gauge, that's static pressure. That's just the pressure of the system, right? Well, stagnation properties account for the kinetic motion of the fluid. So static properties um, just measure the, the pressure but stagnation properties or, the, or pressure, for example, here account for that forward velocity and it's commonly uh, measured with what we call a pitot tube. So you can see here, this is similar to your pressure gauge and this is your pitot tube where you take into account this forward velocity and the static pressure. So stagnation pressure is uh, the static pressure plus one half rho V squared. So you can see that kinetic energy being accounted for. This is a simplification for incompressible flow, but it gives you uh, an idea of what's going on. Static pressure plus uh, forward motion pressure or uh, dynamic pressure is what we call it. And it's this stagnation pressure that's really the driving force in systems. Going from high pressure to low pressure, you're looking at stagnation pressure. And if you're just looking at pressures throughout your system, static is what you are really measuring. So let's look at those equations. As I said before, that was a simplified equation. Here are the true equations where we're taking into account Mach number here, and that's where that velocity comes into play because Mach number is the uh, fluid velocity relative to the local sonic velocity or this local speed of sound. Again, this is its true form. Gamma here is a specific heat ratio. So we got stagnation pressure, stagnation temperature, and stagnation enthalpy here. Enthalpy is a very interesting case because with enthalpy, we can do some sanity checks on our system, and that's what I like to do. So if we look at our uh, conservation of energy, and we're assuming the system is adiabatic, so no heat transfer, that the change in elevation is negligible, well, then this H plus 1 half V squared ought to be constant, right? Oh, well, you can see here that is the definition of stagnation enthalpy. So if you have an adiabatic system and the there are, is no elevation change or you can consider them negligible, you should see your stagnation enthalpy be constant throughout your system. And we will see that. Okay, so overall difficulties with compressible flow. Uh, those last few slides show us that it's very complex and quite mathy, which is fun for some people, but it's hard to solve. Now let's add heat transfer. Again, remember I was showing you that uh, adiabatic simplification, well, now we've got heat transfer, right? Well, good luck trying to solve all that with a complex network, let alone just a single pipe, complex network in Excel. If you're like me, you're probably feeling like, uh, I don't know what to do, right? All right. Well, let's go through what I call a simple example in quotes because nothing's really simple with compressible flow, but we can understand it. Okay, so here, if you've never seen arrow, that's okay. All we've got here is a system going from high pressure, a high pressure tank or pressure junction from 50 PSI down to 25 PSI. And we're dealing with air, so just a pretty standard simple system to get the point across. And what I'm gonna do is run the model. So we uh, converge on solutions, we can figure out what's going on on the inside of these pipes. Okay, great. Well, it's always good to show visuals. So let's go look at our graph results. And I just want to show you a little bit of what we were talking about with those uh, fundamental equations earlier. Okay, so what we're looking at here in this red line is the velocity profile through one of those pipes to the end. Now you can see um, velocity is increasing a little bit, then it jumps when it connects with the other pipe, and you can see how it gradually increases until the end of the pipe. And that's, again, something not predicted by incompressible flow. And that's why you need a software like Aero to account for it along the length of the pipe, how that velocity is changing. But what's especially interesting is how temperature follows the uh, opposite pattern nearly symmetrically. So if we go back to our fundamental equations here, we can see, well, as velocity is going up, right, enthalpy is going down, static enthalpy. Well, that 
directly correlates with temperature going down as well. So you can see that coupling effect here. Now let's look at pressure. Pressure is also going to do that same thing where it drops throughout the pipe. That's pretty normal, what you would expect uh, through any piping system is that it drops throughout. But again, you don't see a linear pressure drop. It's got a little curve to it. Again, similar to that temperature profile. Now let's look at enthalpy and I will show you what I mentioned earlier. Here, do you see this stagnation enthalpy right here? It is constant throughout my whole system. That's because I'm one, adiabatic, and number two, my elevation change is negligible. But you can see my static enthalpy is dropping similar to how the temperature was dropping, again, from that energy balance there. All pretty cool stuff, but this is meant to show you that Compressible flow um, is quite complex, but it can be made simple with a software like Aero. But people tend to overlook the need for software because you know they've been doing it for so long and um, they know the assumptions they can make. And while that's true, it's not impossible. You know, why would you go through the headache of trying to solve that in Excel? And again, that was a simple system. And to drive the point home, our software has been used you know, commercially for 25, over 25 years. NASA has been a customer of ours since the 90s, and they extensively use Aero software. So you can trust the software, and it will do the heavy lifting for you. So let's talk about how Aero solves your network. So as I said, we have to solve those uh, differential equations, but it does it numerically instead of solving, you know, so it solves it in chunks, in distinct and discrete chunks. So, and we can't just look at the inlet and outlet conditions of the pipe like Fathom does. There's too many variables changing down the profile. So Arrow iterates at each one of those stations throughout the pipe. And it iterates on those five variables, pressure, temperature, density, velocity, and enthalpy. And it does it all the way down the pipe. This is what we call marching. Now marching again is just going down the length of the pipe instead of looking at inlet outlet. Now the style of marching is what determines these segments lengths. You might be asking, well, how do you determine what that change in length really is for the software to solve? Well, it's either based on your defined length or a Mach number change. So let's see. It's a little easier to see with the visualization here. Okay. So right here, we've got a constant delta x, right? So we've got the inlet here and we've got the outlet here. Fathom will just look at those two points. Arrow Again, compressible flow, we'll have to look at each one of these stations and calculate it so we can get that, those interesting profiles throughout the length of the pipe. So constant delta x. And then here, we're not going to have a constant delta x. You can see it's shrinking a little bit, but rather it's based on a Mach number change, which can be a little more accurate because uh, Mach number drives a lot of the system properties. Now, what the default of arrow is to do is a hybrid of the chain of a constant change in length and a constant change in Mach number. What it does is it will assume a constant change in length unless Mach number changes too much, usually over uh, 0.01, and then it will switch over to this uh, constant delta Mach number. The point is we're solving the uh, length of the pipe very accurately by taking into account the changing Mach number because if it changes from you know 0.1 to 0.6 that's a huge change in system properties and we want to account for that by then you know stopping it from just jumping that far and looking at these uh, changes in Mach numbers and that's what we call length march with Mach number limits uh, we recommend you keep with the de defaults Okay, as I said, it, it assumes a defined length, and then we'll switch to a defined delta Mach number. Okay, now that we talked about some compressible flow theory and how Arrow solves this type of stuff, let's get steam specific. Water and steam is a very unique fluid in the world. Uh, without it, we wouldn't be here, right? It's got a high specific heat, high heat of vaporization, high polarity makes for a good solvent, um, also means you can't follow the ideal gas law. Um, there's a large abundance of it in the world, so uh, it's used in many processes. It's chemically safe, right? And it's got reasonable saturation temperatures and pressures. And what I mean by that is, you know, in your house you can see both steam and water and even ice. They're all in a reasonable temperature range that are fairly easy to approach. 
Okay, so that's the many reasons why Steam is so widely used in process applications. Right. However, Steam does have some extra complications when it comes to modeling, right? So we have to pay attention to saturation. Because they're reasonable, that's nice for us to get up, you know, to uh, get in the vapor phase. But then we have to worry about it condensing out in our piping systems, right? So you want to make sure you're counting for that properly because Arrow will do all calculations assuming it's a superheated vapor. Even if you drop below saturation conditions, it will still solve as if it was a gas, meaning it will extrapolate the data from a gaseous state and extrapolate it down into the two-phase region, but it's still assuming it's a gas. Now, Arrow will warn you that there's saturation going on depending on the database you use, and I'll, and I'll show you that in a little bit. But the point is you've got to be careful of this when you're modeling. You don't have to worry about it with air or oxygen, right? Not usually unless you're in cryogenics, but um, usually, you know, for most air applications, you're just, you know, pumping room temperature air. So you don't usually worry about that. Now, there are also extra regulations on steam because it's so widely used and, and it's such, it spans so many industries that you have to pay attention to the regulations going on. Obviously, every process um, has regulations on it, but it depends on the industry for Steam. Like I said, it's so versatile in its application that you really have to pay attention to that. And that's something useful while well, we can take care of in Arrow because we can set design alerts and we can put in user-defined uh, boundaries that, it, oh, we go above this velocity, oh, um, we want to be warned, or, or our temperature is too hot, our pipe temperature is too hot, right? Okay, oh, a little bit too far there. Now let's go through an example, okay? actually getting into the software. So here we've got a uh, process steam system, one of our examples, right? Essentially what's going on is we've got steam flowing from two boilers, so at uh, 300 PSI and 800 degrees F, so uh, a little, you know, we've superheated after the boiler, so we're starting off at a little higher temperature. But anyway, we've got this point, the point is to show you steam behavior in here, okay? 300 PSI and 800 degrees F, same boilers. And we're uh, supplying steam to six users. Now, these sides are nearly symmetrical, except for what we've got is, uh, we've switched up some of the flows. So this goes from 40 to 50 to 60,000 pounds per hour. Here we go, 50, 40, 60 pounds per hour. And these lengths are a little higher. Now, you don't need to remember all that. What we're going to do is um, see how that affects the system because it has some unexpected behavior. Okay, I'm gonna pin this up to give us more room. Okay, so as I said, the 100s here, user one, two, and three, it increases from 40, 50, to 60. And then these on the right-hand side increase from, or uh, have a swapped, flow rate 50, 40 to 60 pounds per hour. And again, these lengths are a little longer. So let's see what happens. I'm going to put in a design alert to show you exactly how this works. What this means is I'm going to specify, I don't want any velocity in my pipes to be above a certain velocity. So my maximum I'm gonna say is 750 feet per second. Okay, now I'm going to apply that to all of my pipes because I don't want to go that high. That's quite a high velocity. We get significant pressure drop with that. Okay, now that I put that in, it will warn me if my velocities are too high. Run the model, to, again, to get all those profiles, get all the properties throughout the system. Okay, there we go. Oh no, I've got a warning. Ah, do you see that? Velocity is above the maximum design alert of 750 feet per second at the inlet of P107 and the outlet of P107. Well, that's right here. Okay. Man, look at those velocities. That's way higher than what I wanted. But I only see it in this pipe. I don't see it in the rest of the system. As I said, they're nearly symmetrical. But if I look at this pipe, again, 60,000 uh, coming out here and 60,000 pounds per hour coming out here, yet <laughs> this is only 300 feet per second and this is 800, right? 
So that's almost a threefold increase just because of certain changing conditions. And you wouldn't necessarily expect that. It's not intuitive that this would be so high. So what I'd like to do is go to a visual report here. And if you've never used this, it's quite a powerful tool. What we can do is map out what's going on with these velocities and figure out more than that too, uh, what's, you know, why are these velocities changing so much? So let's see, we've got our output for pipes we want. Let's look at the velocity outlet, okay? Just for now. And we're going to go to a color map. And this is just visually appealing. I'm going to show the velocity. Oh, where are we at? Velocity outlet. I want to have five distinct colors for my velocity. So you can see the gist is if it's above some number, it's a certain color. And this just helps show what's going on throughout the system. Oh, okay. Now we're now we're getting somewhere. I'm going to clear this up a little bit. It gets a little uh, cluttered if you have too much going on there. There we go. Okay. Well, right off the bat, you can see I only have one pipe that's red, as we talked about before. But why is that the only pipe that's red? And I mean, up to this point, the system is nearly symmetrical. Nearly, right? Okay, well, let's maybe let's add some pressure data into the mix. Pressure static outlet. And I'm going to um, not show these boiler pipes because it just kind of clutters things up. Okay, oh, well, we can see. Let's see, get that out of the way. Our pressure here is a lot lower than our pressure here, right? Outlet pressure, that is. Do you know what that means? If pressure is lower out here, our density, or sorry, pressure is lower out here, our density we would expect to be lower. Okay, let's go add that in, density. Okay, oh, again, as we expected, our density is lower out than over here. So you can see I'm already getting into all of these coupling effects. The real question is why? Why are these different? Because these pipes are almost the same. Well, this pipe is actually a lot longer, 1.5 times as long as this one. That's the secret. So we have greater pressure drop through the system. Oh, we've got greater, that means greater velocity, right? Well, so that plays clearly a very significant role. So we're already starting this one off with higher velocity. Now, the other thing to take into account is that over here, we've taken off more mass flow right off the bat, right? This mass flow was 50,000 and this one was only 40,000. So we've taken off more here than we have here, okay? That affects our system, and I want to show you that. Even though these lengths are all a little longer, we're going to get, so we're going to see greater pressure drop throughout each one of these pipes, and that compounds the effect of velocity being higher and higher and higher as the time, you know, by the time we get down here, and this doesn't see it as much. But what plays uh, an also significant role is the order in which we have these flow rates. So let me go ahead and make a new scenario here. If you've never used Scenario Manager, I strongly suggest you do so. So switching J106 and J107. What you can do is rather than having different model files, you can have one model file, but just different scenarios where you have different you know, system conditions and all that. Okay, so all I'm going to do, oh, yep, I wanna clear, it's okay. I want to swap this to be 50,000 pounds per hour and this one to be 40,000 pounds per hour. So now we have symmetrical outflows on both sides. Again, pipe lengths are a little different. Let's run the model. Oh man, I have no design alert caution anymore. That means the 
uh, velocity out here is within reason. Oh, and it is. It used to be 800 going up to 1,200, 800 to 1,200. Now it's 600 to 720, all within my design requirements simply by swapping these mass flows because when I, when I take out more from the beginning, that means I have less volumetric flow rate through here. And because, again, it's a longer pipe, those frictional effects and the pressure drop effects aren't as great because I've taken out more flow before. So that alone allowed me to stay within my operating points and my desired less than 700 feet, 50 feet per second. Again, showing the complex nature of compressible flow, but little things like this, if you're in the design phase, making little tweaks to your system can have a great impact on the actual operation. And I hope that all makes sense. Again, the point is you're pulling off more flow before going through all of these extended pipes. So by the time it gets down here, it's a much lower velocity. You have less um, total pressure drop because you have less velocity, right? All of these things are coupled together. Okay. And we can look at the visual report. Why not? I have it pulled up already. And we can see everything is within reason, right? Nothing above that alarming velocity. Okay. So I'm glad we went through that. If you haven't used Arrow before, that's okay. I'm kind of assuming you're a little comfortable with it. Um, but that shows you the gist, right? Okay, well now let's get into the case study of how Qwit Engineering Group actually used AFT Arrow to reduce emissions at a commercial power plant. In uh, Lenexa, Kansas in the USA. Okay, so what was the problem they wanted to solve? Well, emission regulations pushed, power plant, pushed the power plant to change their exhaust process. So this, but this new process, while it reduced emissions, it also introduced damaging acid precipitation when in cold weather. So they've made the exhaust air cleaner, but they've added another complication by changing the process. So they used Aero to analyze their existing steam system to see the effects of introducing new demand for a glycol heater to heat the exhaust. The idea that this steam, we would tap into that steam system, that would go to a heat exchanger to heat up um, this glycol stream, which would then heat the exhaust fluid to keep it above that uh, precipitation point to keep the acid from following, falling out and damaging the process further. So what we found is that, or what they found is the model uh, showed that a new pipe size was required to meet this new system demand. So they, the point is you, they couldn't just, you know, put on an extra uh, load out from it because it would cause more problems and we'll see what those specific problems were. Okay. So here's their basic system. I'm going to open it up in arrow. Okay, here we go. So to help explain what is going on, uh, we've got some uh, inlet flow from uh, different D superheaters here. And we've got some of them closed off because what we wanted to look at is the worst case scenario or the, the most limiting, limiting scenario, which is where our heat exchanger, this guy right here, needed the most flow rate because it was the coldest weather. And while uh, the other steam inlets were closed off and we could only rely on this uh, D superheater here. So what happens, what they're doing again is they have these existing systems in place, some building heating, um, yeah, building heat, a lot going to other process parts. And they wanted to see what adding this heat exchanger would do, right? Okay, great. Well, we've got inlets of 150 PSIG at 385 degrees F. So uh, nothing too crazy, pretty much um, right out of saturation. Okay, well, let's run the model and see what happened. And you can see I have this pipe colored red for a reason, but we'll find that. Okay, let's run it. Okay, pretty fast solving, that's good. Oh no, you can see right away that we've got critical warnings in our system, that the flow demand through the path starting at pipe five and ending at pipe nine is above sonic flow and cannot be supplied. Okay. What that means is I'm going to go back to the workspace from pipe five through pipe nine. And this is, 
I think this is pipe nine. No, oh, pipe 11, okay, pipe nine right here, sorry. Okay, going through the flow of this profile, we've hit sonic choking. And what we are telling Fathom to do is even though we have that going on, we need to force a flow rate of this much out of the system. Well, it can't because it's hit its um, sonic velocity, it's choked, it cannot supply more flow even though you're telling it to. So what we see is that these results are not going to be very meaningful because right out of the sonic choke point, uh, we can't calculate the flow because we're telling it what flow it should be, but it can't really be reached. So these results are somewhat meaningless um, to a certain extent, at least past that choke point of pipe five. Okay, so if you've never heard of sonic choking before or you don't quite understand it, that's okay. It's a very complicated thing. Um, but in essence, what you're saying is that the velocity is so high, you've actually reached the local speed of sound. And the speed of sound is how fast a pressure wave will propagate, right? So that's how we speak to each other. It propagates through the air. Well, your fluid is trying to flow faster than that, but it can't. It hit the limit. So it is stopped. There's nothing you can do to this flow rate, to this downstream flow rate, to cause it to flow more. You've reached its point or its stopping point. And it has to do with some thermodynamic um, processes. And if you've heard of something called the, the Fano line, pretty much what it means is you've reached the maximum entropy possible. Uh, entropy is really the driving force for all thermodynamic processes. And once we've hit the maximum, we can't go anymore. So it really comes down to that second law there. Anyway, long story short is you can't, you can't go faster. And the reason is we've got a six inch pipe. Well, that happens to be too restricting. So if we make this pipe a little bigger, our velocity will go down, right? Pressure drop will go down and we won't reach, well, that's, I guess that was the point of the study is we won't reach sonic velocity there. Spoiler alert, that's what happens. But before we even do that, I wanna create a scenario here running this with ASME steam, because this is something I haven't brought up, but we have different fluid databases to run your model with, right? So if I look at my system properties, I was using the AFT standard steam, and that's great. It uses the redlick kwong equation of state. That's fine and dandy, but it will not tell you of uh, saturation conditions. So a lot of you, if you have worked with STEAM in the past with AFT Arrow, you are likely to choose ASME STEAM tables. So instead of having an equation of state, we actually have the tabular data of different densities, specific volumes, enthalpies at uh, pressures and temperatures. So like any other STEAM tables, uh, we got these in our software. Now this makes modeling a little more difficult because rather than having a continuous equation of state, we're uh, interpolating between table values. So it takes a little longer for the software to solve, um, but the good news is that with the steam tables, it will warn us of saturation conditions. Again, it will not model two-phase flow, but it will warn you, hey, you drop a flow below saturation, and you might wanna take a look at your results because it might not be valid. If, if you're so far below, you're really subcooled, let's say. So that's what it'll warn you of. And what we tend to recommend to people is to start off using AFT standard STEAM to calibrate your model. Uh, it's faster and it's a little more smooth as far as the solver goes. And then go ahead and compare it to what ASME STEAM would say. Make sure your results are valid. Make sure you're not hitting saturation. Let's run this model. Okay, so you can see taking a little long, not too much longer. Oh, but we hit an error with these ASME STEAM properties. Okay, let's check that out. Oh, it's the same kind of error before where we are trying to force a flow, but it really won't flow that much. The difference with ASME STEAM is there's no more uh, solving with the tabular values because it's dropped so low. Let's find some interesting temperatures. I believe uh, P11, oh, not graph outlet.
negative pressure drops, right? I mean, this is all very weird results. The point is, it's not actually even able to get to these tabular values. But the important thing I wanted to show you is, do you see temperature is below saturation line? And that's the power of the ASME STEAM database when working with STEAM. Again, it's one of those extra considerations that you have to be aware of when modeling STEAM is be careful of your saturation because it will want to model it as gas, but really you're two-phase. So although these results are not valid and you can see there's no solution, again, because of that problem with the sonic choking, uh, I wanted to show you the power of ASME STEAM in showing you that there is saturation. You might want to adjust your model a little bit. Okay. Well, enough with that. Let's go into the base scenario again, where we have the normal AFT standard fluid, right? Okay, but we were dealing with the six inch pipe. Now let's see the effect of having a 10 inch pipe here is. Okay, I'm gonna open it up, the pipe properties window, okay. Let's just go ahead and make that 10 inch. And I'm going to keep the same schedule. And that's it. And we're going to see, again, this pipe matters because it's a part of this flow path. And that's where we saw the restriction, right? P5 through P6, 8, and 9. That's where we saw that restriction. If we have this pressure open, that won't happen. And if this pressure is open, it also will not happen. This happened to be the limiting case where we got this desuperheater over here. Now let's run it at 10 inches and see what we get. Hey, no sonic choking, no restrictions of flow. Now we've got real results, things we can work with. And they found they can supply their glycol heater remember this extra heat exchanger off their auxiliary steam system, if they replace this six inch pipe with a 10 inch pipe. Now, what I want to show you as well is let's, let's go back in here to the base scenario with six inch pipe. It's, it's reaching sonic velocity, right? Which means that's, a mass, that's gonna be a massive velocity. Oh, tools. But I wanna put in another design alert to say, Okay, so they Qit needed a max velocity. Their uh, standard operations, they can only have a maximum velocity of oh, velocity of 40,000 feet per minute. So that is their own, like that's their standard as an engineering firm. Makes sense? There are no parameters in the list. Okay. Going to apply that to all pipes. Excellent. Okay, so we're in the base scenario with six inch pipe. Again, we're not going to get meaningful results because of the restriction, but oh, not only that, we've actually shown our design alert will pop up and warn us hey, your velocity is way higher than expected. So if we change our units to feet per minute here, you'll see we are way above 40,000, naturally because we're hitting sonic velocity. But let's see how that affects us with the 10 inch pipe, right? I changed, um, because I changed something in my base scenario, I changed it in all the other children's scenario. So you can see my design alert here is in place because I added it to the parent. Now let's see, we can supply the flow, that's great, but are we operating with high velocities? No, we're not. We're within those uh, reasonable operating conditions. Excellent. So imagine trying to figure all this out without a tool like Arrow, where you can simply increase the size of a pipe on your limiting condition to see, okay, well, am I going to get restriction with this? And no, I want that alone solved and actually would work with an eight inch pipe, but they want some margin naturally. So if they're going to be replacing the pipe, might as well put in a 10 inch pipe anyway. Um, to ensure we're not reaching those sonic uh, velocities there. Okay. I've also run everything here. I'm going to do ASME steam with this one. So I've run it with AFT standard steam, but let's look at ASME steam. Again, following the good modeling practices of starting with AFT standard and then going to steam. 
Okay, clear my results, that's okay. Yes, I want that. Run it. Might take a little bit. Okay, perfect, not too long. Ah, now we're getting good results with ASME Steam as well, right? No saturation conditions we're worried about. Again, no sonic uh, velocity we're reaching. Everything seems to be working out pretty well. Well, I want to show you also what happens. You know, actually, I will do it with the 10-inch pipe. Let's add some heat transfer because that's a big deal in compressible flow, as I said, right? Right now, we're still assuming everything's adiabatic. So you can see that here, all pipes are adiabatic. Something that's very nice with the AFT Arrow software is we can do global editing. So if you haven't seen this before, it's a, a magnificent feature where we can choose, I'm gonna choose all pipes, right? Select pipe data. And I only want to change the heat transfer for all of these pipes. Okay, let's do convective heat transfer, right? Okay, so what this means is there is uh, air around the pipes and there is a little bit of flow with it, right? You know, there's even in a room, you've got some air velocity. The point is that causes some heat transfer, especially through steel pipes. So in power plant, let's say it's 80 degrees Fahrenheit inside of the plant, right? Our fluid velocity, 0 0.2 feet per second. Let's add some insulation. You know, so it's not adiabatic, but it's realistic to have some insulation. And here we go down and we specify what's going on. So fluid internal, yes, we want that um, correlation to find the Nusselt number, all those things to get the heat transfer inside of the pipe, pipe wall, conductivity uh, from the database, from using steel, ANSI steel. Then we got insulation. Okay, well, I want to use a database. I'm going to use fiberglass, and I'm going to say that is three inches of insulation. And I'm going to use my correlation for my external heat transfer, right? And that's where these numbers come into play, okay? Heat transfer, so I'm just going to apply my heat, just the heat transfer data to my pipes. Everything else about the pipes are their, their own specifications. All I've done is change the heat transfer data. Okay, now let's see what happens. All right, perfect, nothing special, right? That heat transfer is probably pretty minimal, um, but I wanted to show you how you can do that and Arrow will account for it. What I like to see, let's go through pipe five, that cross tie there. We can look at these heat transfer diagrams that get generate, generated. So we can analyze our system quite quickly. So here we've got our fluid, right? That's hot steam, 380 degrees inlet and outlet of the pipe. Then we can see uh, this resistance or the, the heat transfer network here, resistance network of going convection, conduction, conduction, and then convection again on that outer wall. But look at that, 160 degrees Fahrenheit on the outer wall of that insulation. That's very reasonable. I know there are a lot of um, regulations on what that temperature is allowed to be depending on what your use of the steam is, but we can use this diagram to quickly tell that. And what I've shown is there's no problems by adding heat transfer. In fact, it was a fairly easy modification to do in the model just so I can test and make sure. And um, obviously, you'd put in the data you're actually dealing with. Uh, but that's the power of Arrow and how Qit Engineering was able to confirm they could reduce their emissions by adding and replacing the 6-inch pipe with the 10-inch pipe. Okay. Great. Well, that concludes what we're talking about today, right? So I wanna give you some tips, what we learned. We wanna start and calibrate your system with AFT standard steam. When you're first building your model, make sure it runs at, you know, at steady state normally, uh, because if you get any hiccups along the way, it's better to do it with AFT uh, standard because it'll solve a little easier, and you'll know right off the bat there's a problem rather than getting into a more complex database. Uh, and I say possibly more refined results because uh, again, if we're dropping below saturation, you know, ASME will tell you, but it will not model the two-phase. And also, it's interpolated uh, tabular data. So you really ought to just compare the two. More likely than not, ASME Steam is more accurate, but again, it's a table rather than an equation of state. Okay. Use design alerts. They're your friend. You can put those in user specified to say, okay, 
uh, I don't I, I want to make sure my wall temperature does not go above this because I'm you know some uh, employee codes there right I don't want to go above a certain velocity because I don't want to have too much pressure drop and you know it's dangerous to have too much velocity going through pipes a lot of four sets and stuff like that right they're your friend they're user specified and they're really easy to apply and with sonic choking lowering the downstream pressure will not increase flow when sonic choking occurs so our model I showed you with the sonic choking was actually with the flow rate increasing the flow rate does not make aero solve any better you can't you can't get the flow rate because it's reached its maximum thermodynamically and the same goes for lowering the pressure if we had a pressure junction out there by dropping that again I'm not going to get any more flow I can't I reached the maximum Aero solves that magnificently, so you'll know right away you're at your sonic limits and you can't go any further. So you need to reduce the velocity, and that's the point. You can reduce the velocity several ways, maybe increasing the downstream pressure or decreasing the downstream flow, but we needed that flow demand, so that wasn't reasonable. Uh, increase the size of your pipe. That also will reduce your velocity where it's choked. Finally, compressible flow can be unintuitive. As we saw, we can get a huge difference in velocities when the system is nearly symmetrical, right? Or we can get velocity changing throughout the length of a pipe. It's not intuitive. It's not as simple. Well, even incompressible flow, I wouldn't say is simple. Uh, but you can't make these simplifying assumptions the same way. So you need to have a tool like Arrow to help you out. And I assure you, using Arrow to build all those systems was infinitely easier than trying to solve this with Excel and safer because in Excel you make a lot of assumptions as well like those incompressible assumptions as I said take your time to understand your system if something seems a little off or odd like we went through in that process uh, steam system example with the six outflows don't just assume there's something broken Take your time to understand what's going on. Look at your pressure profiles, your density profiles, your velocity profiles. See what's going on and, and understand the coupling nature of compressible flow with, with uh, mass continuity, the conservation of momentum, conservation of energy. All of those things are coupled together and it takes some time to understand your system. Okay. So as a final plug, AFT, as I said, is a modeling company. So we make several products for your modeling needs. AFT Aero, compressible flow. AFT Fathom, incompressible flow. Again, liquids and low velocity gases. AFT Impulse is for water hammer, surge analysis. That is a whole nother topic that we will actually be going through um, in the next you know, few months, next webinars, you can look out for that because surge and water hammer is a very interesting topic and AFT has software to solve that. Um, each one of these has some add-on modules, so GSC, Goal Seeking Control, ANS Automated S S uh, Network Sizing, and Fathom has also GSC. It has the Extended Time Simulation and Settling Slurry add-on module as well. I don't want to get too in-depth. We're going to have webinars on these, so you can expect to understand them a little bit better later on. And Impulse has a Settling Slurry and Pulsation Frequency Analysis, kind of unique to uh, fast transient where you've got you know uh, positive displacement pumps causing lots of vibration throughout pipes okay we got utilities we got Kempac property database to expand your modeling needs so as I showed you we have AFT standard database we also have NIST ref prop that I didn't, I didn't go through but Kempac is a little more refined database with uh, 700 fluids and you can use it for uh, fathom and arrow and impulse and we also provide consulting services when you're in a bind and need help quickly. And that would be our flow expert package. So I want to thank you for spending your time with me today. Again, my name is Walt Prentice, business applications engineer with Applied Flow Technology. Uh, here's our contact information. If you have any uh, questions, need technical support, you can email that contact right there. And if you have any sales questions, there you go. There's the email, sales at AFT.com. So I want to thank you again, and I wish you happy engineering.